When I say the words shoulder pads, what comes to mind? You might think of the 80s, which is totally fair. The 80s shoulder pad is arguably the most era-defining trend of the last century. But I want you to dig deeper. Why do you think this trend has come in and out of fashion over the years? You might have the idea from a Devil Wears Prada that designers and executives make arbitrary decisions that in turn dictate the trend cycle. But in order for a trend to have the longevity to define an entire decade, it needs to find a niche within the aesthetic sensibilities of an era. Those aesthetic sensibilities aren't arbitrary. They're influenced by what's going on in the world. So what was going on in the world that made people want to wear shoulder pads? Well, colonialism, World War II, Ronald Reagan, and Lady Gaga. Hi, I'm Taipei, and this is the history of shoulder pads. For as long as anyone can remember, humans have looked for ways to alter their appearance. Exhibit A. One of the most high-impact ways to do this is to make certain body parts appear larger, often through the use of padding. Europeans especially were huge fans of this. Take for example the 16th century codpiece that served a dual purpose of both protecting and exaggerating the male crotch area. Or the 18th century panniers, which Marie Antoinette wore to take her hips to astronomical proportions. The shoulders were also a target for exaggeration. We can see this in multiple trends of the 19th century, including the gigot sleeves of the 1830s and the lego mutton sleeves of the 1890s. Side note, we definitely need more fashion trends named after foods. But neither of these trends technically used shoulder pads. Instead, they used an excess of gathered fabric to broaden and lift the shoulders. The modern shoulder pad wasn't actually invented for fashionable purposes. You see, in the early days of American football, players weren't wearing any padding. This made the sport extremely dangerous, and a lot of players were dying. So, in 1877, a Princeton student by the name of L.P. Smock proposed a design for the first shoulder pad. His design was made of leather and wool, and it wasn't terribly protective, but it did provide a precedence for the modern shoulder pad we know and love today. So, how do we go from sports equipment to fashion statement? To answer this question, we need to explore the history of French colonialism and old Hollywood glamour. In 1931, the French Empire was at the height of its power, but it was having a PR problem. France's domestic economy was entering into a slump, and anti-colonial movements were gaining traction all over the world, including in India and Vietnam. So, to refurbish her public image, France joined forces with her colonial buddies, the United States and Belgium, and a few others, to put on l'Exposition Colonielle, or the Colonial Exposition. The exposition, which was held in Paris from May to November of 1931, was a massive propaganda effort, with exhibits stretching across 272 acres. These exhibits touted the cultural diversity and wealth of the colonies, while, of course, suppressing the violent reality of upholding colonialism. An estimated 8 million people visited, including the designer Elsa Scaparelli. During the exposition, Scaparelli was particularly inspired by costumes from Southeast Asia, so much so that they're cited as the inspiration for the shoulder pads she would put in her collection later that year. Now, there are conflicting reports on exactly what costumes inspired her, but my best guess would be the extravagant classical dance costumes from either Cambodia or Thailand. This 1931 Scaparelli collection is considered by some to be the beginning of the shoulder pad craze that would build over the rest of the decade. Some people dispute this and say it was Marcel Rochas, but regardless, he was also inspired by the colonial exhibition. It isn't clear to me what Scaparelli's personal views were on the exhibition, but I think it's still important that we recognize the initial inspiration behind this trend. Some fashion publications will leave this as a footnote, but I think it's critical to understand that the fashion industry was just as much entrenched in colonialism as any other. And as we continue to call out cultural appropriation on the runway today, 
let's not lose sight of the countless examples of this happening throughout history. So Scaparelli's and Rochas's designs don't influence the general public right away, but they do inspire the legendary Hollywood costume designer, Adrian. Adrian was tasked with creating the costumes for the pre-code film Letty Linton. He was allegedly asked by producers to create a design that would hide Joan Crawford's big shoulders. So of course, he did the opposite. What Adrian came up with was a white cotton organdy gown with dramatic ruffles that exaggerated the shoulders rather than minimizing them. This was totally different from the slinky bias cut dresses of the time, and the style spread like wildfire. All of the major department stores sold knockoffs, with Macy's alone selling 10,000. This was a major moment in fashion history. It showed the world that Hollywood had just as much, if not more, influence on the general public than the designers in Paris. Now, I wasn't able to determine if the original Letty Linton dress actually had shoulder pads in it, but I think it's fair to say that Adrian's use of the shoulder ruffles started the overall trend of shoulder exaggeration. This motif would eventually transform into larger shoulder pads, especially in formal wear. The shoulders were big, but they were still delicate and feminine, which was so emblematic of the 30s. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. In 1941, the United States entered into World War II, and the shoulder pad train had no signs of stopping. As many women entered into factory jobs to support the war effort, they were encouraged to dress in a way that imitated men's clothing. This militarized costume included tailored skirt suits that were paired with tighter skirts, either pencil or A-line, that were meant to save fabric. This was in complete contrast to the ladylike evening gowns from the 30s. Of course, Hollywood still finds a way to make this trend glamorous and unattainable. One of the best examples of the 40s power shoulder is once again Joan Crawford. But this time, it's the incredible fur jacket that she wears in Mildred Pierce in 1945. The shoulder pads are definitely what won her the Oscar. But while mainstream, white-dominated fashion followed the government's prescription for the tailored skirt suit, many communities of color took this trend in a different direction. The Zoot Suit is a dramatically oversized suit with huge shoulder pads. It originated with black entertainers in the 20s and quickly spread to multiple communities of color across the country. In Los Angeles, it became a symbol of subversion and identity for Mexican, black, and Filipino youths. The style was a target for racist violence, most notably the 1943 Zoot Suit riots, where Mexican-American teenage boys in LA were stripped and beaten by white servicemen. The suit also has precedence in women's fashion, which was pioneered by Las Pachucas. Pachucas were a subgroup of Mexican-American women and girls in Los Angeles. They wore oversized fashions, including the zoot suit, to subvert the racist and misogynistic expectations people placed on them. In response to World War II, shoulder pads were universally adopted in women's fashion, but they took on different meanings for different groups. Shoulder pads meant wartime diligence for working class women, extravagance for Hollywood stars, and subversive self-expression for Las Pachucas. By the end of the decade, shoulder pads were waning in popularity. The nail in the coffin was Christian Dior's revolutionary new look, which was released in his 1947 debut collection. Dior featured full skirts, tiny waists, and sloped shoulders, officially putting an end to the big shoulder era. Over the following years, shoulder pads continued to be used as suits and in menswear, but for practical reasons, and not as a fashion statement. But this wasn't the end for our padded friend. In 1978, Yves Saint Laurent would reintroduce the shoulder pad as part of his Broadway Suits collection. But as we saw in the early 30s, trends don't come out of nowhere. They need something to latch onto in order to gain popularity with the general public. So if YSL provided the spark for the next shoulder pad fire, what was the fuel? In order to understand why shoulder pads made such a major comeback in the 80s, we need to explore the cultural and social conditions of the preceding decades. Over the last 15 years, the United States had seen unprecedented waves of social political change brought on by the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War protest movement, and women's lib. 
There was also intense economic uncertainty from stagflation and the energy crisis. And on a cultural level, the late 70s were the zenith of disco, a musical movement considered by many to represent sexual liberation. In light of all of the progress and turbulence of the 60s and 70s, it makes sense that there was a reactionary conservative movement bubbling in the background. This new wave conservatism would finally erupt at the end of the decade, with the elections of UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and US President Ronald Reagan. These landslide victories for conservative parties would dominate cultural and political discourse throughout the 1980s. The ethos of this red wave was well described by Reagan when he said, We're the party that wants to see an America in which people can still get rich. In the 80s, we're all about getting rich. Pop culture of this decade had an obsession with the pursuit of wealth, especially through climbing the corporate ladder. This wasn't revolutionary for men, but for women, it meant glorifying those who asserted themselves into the white-collar workforce. And what did these women wear to demand respect in a male-dominated environment? Shoulder pads. Businesswomen and politicians both wore masculine blazers with gigantic shoulders, including the original girl boss herself, and I mean that in the derogatory way, Margaret Thatcher. These power shoulders fell under the larger umbrella of power dressing, which involves using clothing to assert authority in a professional or political setting. Notably, the style had a lot of similarities with the tailored skirt suits of the 40s, but the 80s version tended to be much more oversized, in both the jackets and of course the hair. This difference is worth exploring. The 80s combination of giant shoulder pads with an oversized fit isn't just a natural evolution from 40s fashion, it's an appropriation from a specific subculture. Remember that YSL show from 78, the one that started this whole thing? In that collection, titled Broadway Suits, YSL was specifically inspired by black Harlem fashions, and his designs bear a striking resemblance to the zoot suit. While the zoot suit and other oversized trends were violently suppressed in the 40s, by the 80s, they served as a direct inspiration for mainstream power dressing. But the perceived respectability of this trend had everything to do with who was wearing it. Big-shouldered and oversized jackets were seen as fashionable on wealthy white women, while the baggy fashions that were popular with hip-hop artists of the time were seen as delinquent. Power shoulders weren't limited to power dressing. They were a near constant in 80s women's fashion. I think anyone who loves surf shopping can verify this, Every 80s garment that you find, whether it's in the $3 bargain bin or a fancy boutique, is going to have shoulder pads. The ubiquity of shoulder pads in 80s women's fashion is also evident in television from the time. Let's look at the popular soap opera, Dynasty. It's a show about catty oil tycoons fighting over this guy, so it makes perfect sense that they would wear giant shoulder pads to display the cartoonish levels of wealth they had. But what about one of my personal favorite shows, The Golden Girls? The Golden Girls are not fabulously wealthy. In fact, the show went against the grain by centering middle-class older women, and yet they're wearing shoulder pads in almost every scene. Now you might expect this from their evening dresses or their jackets, but there's a lot of scenes of them in their pajamas, sitting around the table, eating cheesecake, and yes, even 80s pajamas have shoulder pads. Outside of corporate or casual wear, shoulder pads were also used to make artistic statements. Grace Jones is a great example of an artist who uses shoulder pads as part of her androgynous personal style. The amped up and masculine shoulder pads she wore were then juxtaposed with more feminine elements, like high-heeled pumps. Are you feminine? Do you like being masculine? I like uh, being both, actually. What, uh, being masculine, what is that? I mean, can you tell me what is being masculine? With shoulder pads infiltrating 80s culture from every angle, it's no wonder that their production was sky high. For example, in 1988, the Majestic Shapes Factory, which is an amazing name, manufactured as much as 100,000 pairs of shoulder pads every day. If you were to wear that many shoulder pads at once, your shoulders would be 1.5 miles high. The 80s shoulder pads were also super convenient. Their 30s and 40s counterparts were made of natural materials, so they weren't very durable. But 80s shoulder pads were made of stiffer synthetic materials, so you could wash them without risk of deflation. They even had Velcro detachable shoulder pads. 
By the late 80s, designers were getting tired of the shoulder pad. In reference to her 1985 collection, Vivian Westwood said, I was trying to find a way to kill this big shoulder, to give clothes a sexual dynamic, a feminine one. But many members of the general public were still attached to them. Many people felt like they changed their silhouette for the better. Shoulder the bigger pad, the shoulder, shoulder pad, the better the, the better the look. My small dog walks around with shoulder pads. I think everyone should wear shoulder pads. I have them in my pajamas. The power shoulder would continue into the early 90s, although by then it was mostly restricted to jackets and blazers. See the iconic mom from Home Alone for reference. But as the 90s progressed, shoulder pads disappeared completely, especially as fashion became tighter and more youthful. After their decades-long reign of terror had ended, it would be a while before shoulder pads would re-enter into the trend cycle. But now that we understand their past, what can we expect from their future? Throughout the late 90s to the mid-2000s, shoulder pads were pretty obscure. This time was all about showing as much skin as possible, which you can't do if it's being covered up by a shoulder pad. But popular culture started to shift in the late 2000s, specifically in December of 2007. When the housing bubble popped, the United States and the world plunged into the Great Recession. And remember how times of economic uncertainty in the 30s and the 70s led to the power shoulder trend? Well, it happened again. During the Great Recession, pop culture was all about clubbing and partying and lying to the world about how much fun you're having. This included 80s revivalism, which of course meant that shoulder pads were back. Although a lot of 80s trends were having a comeback, they were being used in a new context. Fashion of this time was really led by female pop stars, especially Lady Gaga and Rihanna. Now, the Gagafication of the recession could easily be another video, but in this case, it meant that shoulder pads were being used in a much more couture and dramatic way. The shoulder padded jackets tended to be a lot tighter and stretchier than their 80s counterparts because, of course, no one had a job, so instead you'd wear them to the club. This 80s revivalism would only last for a few years and died out after 2012. Shoulder pads would continue to make spotty appearances in fashion throughout the 2010s, although they seemed to cycle more often and without dominating as much. And that brings us to today. As of right now, a lot of fashion forecasters are predicting that shoulder pads will be a major trend next year. We're already starting to see them creep up in oversized blazers and those cropped biker jackets that have taken over K-pop. I have some thoughts. As fun as it would be, I don't foresee shoulder pads regaining the kind of global domination that they had in the 40s or the 80s. With that said, I do feel like they fit exceptionally well into early 2020s fashion. Since the pandemic, Fashion has been maximalist and strange, probably as a rejection of the minimalism of the 2010s. So if we're gonna wear giant cargo pants, wolf cuts, and those silly little red shoes, it makes perfect sense to throw shoulder pads in the mix. But this time, they're gonna be much more absurd and ironic. The next time you read an article or you see a TikTok that tells you shoulder pads will be the next big thing, please remember, fashion doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's a response to contemporary cultural discourse, whether that be colonialism, war, or recession. And in the case of shoulder pads, it represents the aspirations people have for power, wealth, and identity. Thank you so much for staying until the end of the video. As a thank you, here's some bonus footage. You see, this is actually the second time that I filmed this YouTube video, and I had to throw out the entire set that I did last time. I think you'll hear why. This difference is the ubiquity of shoulder pads is that their production had to be sky high. Note to self, don't film in leather ever again. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. It's totally complimentary, which means it's free, and it really helps me out. You can also find me on my other socials, at Taipei Queen. I'm Taipei, and until next time, bye.